Boys and Mr. X by Heath Mayfield from Visual Feast Publishing. Now, are we arriving at the moment of truth? Or at least very close to it? Is this how the series of the actual killing events transpired? Concentrating not so much on the characters that are mentioned as supposedly to be present at the time, but to the actual sequence and reactions to the blasts of the loudly barking pump action shotgun had. Once again, discount any particular individual that may so far have been mentioned or whatever position that the shooter was supposed to be in as far as hiding in the dark or arriving at the last moment for the meeting and simply concentrate on the particularly firing order that was used. This has been deemed to be the actual sequence and not any other that has been proposed so far based on the results of the meticulous modern day reconstructions using dummies and paying acute attention to the time taken to fire the first five blasts so as to incapacitate the trio and render them helpless. And then for the coup de grace to have taken place, as it has been suggested by other parties. As Mr X and Nichols waited, hidden by a bushy hedge close by the closed farm gate at the ambush location, it was then that Mr X sitting next to Nichols in the VW produced the pistol gripped pump action shotgun that had been specifically sourced for the murders from a reliable source. Because it had to be guaranteed to function as designed and expected within close range, stored within the canvas bag, a regular length shotgun with a full shoulder butt would be too restrictive and cumbersome for use in a confined closed space. He then proceeded to load the magazine chamber with five 12 gauge cartridge shells. Then he took some extra rounds from the bag and placed them into his jacket pocket as he knew they would require them to complete the killings to his satisfaction. When the Range Rover finally arrived at the location entering Workhouse Lane, Pat Tate received a phone call from his girlfriend wanting to know where he was. He told her that he could not talk just then as he was with someone or waiting for someone. When the Range Rover had eventually come to a halt at the locked farm gate, however Tate wasn't about to answer any calls at this time. He wanted to stay on the high he was on while he waited to commence with the meat and the deal. This was supposed to sort out all his financial troubles and put an end to his woes. He might have even considered repaying Mr X and the Blundells for his outstanding debts. All three, Tucker, Tate and Rolf had been happily manic and in high spirits and they were doing drugs, laughing and hooting while sitting waiting in anticipation of benefiting immensely from the expected transaction over the next short period of time. Pat Tate had received a voice message on his phone that he did not respond to. It was a call from his partner asking where Pat was. As it was now getting late, as they were expecting to be going to dinner shortly and it was starting to get close to the booked dinner reservation time, Tony Tucker also had a voicemail on his phone that he did not reply to making the same inquiry. It was in this fairly brief time, approximately about 7pm to 7.30, possibly 8 o'clock after the Range Rover had come to a halt at the locked fun gate. Mick Steele had unsuspiciously alighted from the Range Rover on the pretext of opening the closed farm gate so they could enter the field on the other side of the gate to meet the contemporaries and conduct the supposed transaction. The vehicle was still running and it had the full beam headlights on at this stage, brightly illuminating the gate that was sitting closed and locked. At this point, it has been suggested that both Mr X and Darren Nichols were standing outside of the hidden VW, with Mr X hidden in the dark and under covers of some bushes very close to where the Range Rover was stopped. It has been suspected that Darren Nichols was crouched a little further away from the Range Rover, but he had a clear vision and a line of sight, which allowed him to at least witness some of the shotgun fire flashes when discharged, plus witnessing both Mr X and Mick Steele hauling the body of Tony Tucker back into a forward facing position in the front passenger seat after receiving his final third shotgun blast to his head and being deemed as being dead. It would have made no difference at all to Nichols if he'd been sitting in the VW while the murders took place or standing outside witnessing the action as he'd already been that involved as a willing accomplice that anything that he witnessed 
would not matter to Mr X. Nichols was supposed to honour his word and loyalty and never speak of the murders for his own protection and the protection of Mick Steele. Nichols was well aware of the consequences that would befall him if he revealed the true identity of Mr X. It has been said, as Mick Steele walked past the seated Rolf in the Range Rover, staying within the vision of all three men sitting in the vehicle and capturing their combined attention, but purposely leaving the rear driver's side door of the Range Rover ajar. This action would allow the interior light of the Range Rover to illuminate the scene inside of the vehicle well enough for Mr X to see all of the targets clearly and utilise the advantage. Given the fact that peering out of a lit environment makes it harder to see what is outside in the dark. More than it is to see inside the illuminated area from out in the dark. Plus the added fact that Pat Tate, while he was staring at me still making his way to the locked gate and could not see or aware of Mr X and his position standing directly alongside the Range Rover. When Mr X then quickly and quietly appeared at the door left ajar and he was left unnoticed by any of the occupants. He reached into the rear offside open door of the vehicle with the barrel of the hand grip pistol shotgun allowing it just to be behind the driver's headrest and with his left shoulder and elbow being inside of the Range Rover close to the surprise Tate. He immediately shot Craig Rolf in the rear lower right hand side of the head and behind the right ear immobilizing him instantly and leaving blood spatter on the vehicle's interior and Rolf was lolling to his left hand side towards a terrified Tony Tucker with Rolf still holding the steering wheel and with his foot on the brake. It took Mr X only one and a half seconds to eject the spent shell leaving it to come to rest on the ground close to the Range Rover on the driver's side. Mr X then altered his angle slightly and then fired another blast in the general direction of the still shocked Pat Tate who was sitting positioned in the middle of the rear seats of the Range Rover with his feet slightly entrapped under the front passenger side seat and the driver's side seat. This blast of the shotgun had deeply grazed Tate's head as he tried to initially react from the unexpected attack but this injury did not cause Tate to lose consciousness and the bulk of the shotgun blast blew out of the noticeable portion of the rear passenger side window of the Range Rover but not all of it. Tate was leaning in a bent position to his left and was able to raise his right arm in a gesture as if to try and shield him from another blast of the shotgun. When Mr X again ejected the U shell that also came to rest on the ground on the driver's side of the door. Then after taking approximately another second and a half to do so, he then adjusted the angle that he was standing at so he could specifically fire another more purposefully aimed blast at Tony Tucker who by now had sprung to attention. Mr X then quickly shifted his position in order to purposely reach inside of the Range Rover to point the shortened shotgun close to the stunned Tony Tucker who by now had successfully opened the passenger side door where he was seated not wearing his seatbelt and he had swung his legs out of the vehicle in an attempt to flee the Range Rover and escape the attack. When Tucker then instinctively turned his head through instinct to the right slightly in his direction of the assailant at the last moment. This allowed Mr X who was leaning bodily into the Range Rover to fire a blast of the shotgun at close range into Tucker's right side of his face immobilizing him and send him into an unconscious state if not killing him. This sent blood and tissue splattering against the Range Rover's front interior and originally leaving Tucker's head still in a forward position with his nose being separated from his face above his top lip and hanging in a flap away from his face. Some of his teeth had been blown out of his face. Any shot passing through Tucker's face wound would have continued through the open door space and blood splatters were found on the front windscreen and interior of the vehicle including a portion of the front passenger side unbroken window. Tate had come to rest leaning close to the rear passenger side door in vain an agonising effort to try and escape what he now had to face and he was moaning and blabbering in a strained and futile attempt to ward off another blast of the shotgun and to plead no, please no. But he did not have any real chance to plead for his life 
as Mr X gave Pat Tate a short piece of his mind before blasting Tate in his right side region at approximately the area of Tate's liver, as specifically designed to do so by Mr X. Mr X then injected the shell which came to rest outside of the Range Rover leaving three distinct blue coloured huge cartridge shells laying on the ice. Mr X then proceeded to point the shotgun even closer to the stricken Tucker by a couple of inches and then fired a fifth blast into the upper right side of Tucker's face just above the first, leaving flushburn marks. This caused the ejected shell to bounce off the car's headlining and land in the rear offside footwell. But again, any shot that may have passed through Tucker's head injuries would have passed through the opened side door of the Range Rover and lost, scattered amongst the nearby bush area along the side of the ambush track, an area that was not investigated to see if any shot fragments, broken flora or signs of impact could be found and used as evidence, as they considered and assumed that the passenger side door to have been closed. The ejected shell from this shot had ended up passing over the slumped head and body of Rolf and rebounding into the driver's side door recess. This blast totally would have killed Tucker. He may have already been dead upon receiving the first shotgun blast to his head, but it was shown in Tucker's autopsy that he had inhaled some blood. But Mr X was not satisfied as to the effect the blast may have had. Mr X had fired the fifth blast from the shotgun that had caused Tucker's body, which had now come to rest leaning to his left-hand side, with his legs already dangling out of the opened car door to shudder slightly, now allowing the fresh warm blood that was freely flowing from Tucker's head wounds to drip into the wheel track left by the Range Rover in the mud and slurry to pull for a brief time, then to be diluted and spread down the sloping track as far as the farm gate to further pull due to the morning melting ice. Mr X was not about to take any chances. He was determined to make sure that all of the victims were indeed dead before making his escape and getaway from the crime scene. Mr X then made his way around to the other side of the Range Rover to where a still conscious Pat Tate was cowering, whimping and moaning. It was then that Mr X patiently and purposely reloaded the five cartridge magazine on the pump action shotgun. He then looked into the rear passenger side of the Range Rover to where Pat Tate was positioned with his head close up against the ordinary partially broken window before making personal comments to Tate regarding Mr X's total disdain for Tate before commencing to fire a sixth shotgun blast point blank into the upper rear portion of Tate's head. In doing so, Mr X invertedly caused shattered glass from the ordinary broken rear passenger window, making a larger hole in the window than there already was in the process, blowing glass fragments behind Tate's ear as was found at the autopsy. It also left a clump of bloody tissue to adhere to the bottom of the window at the top of the door panel. Then this allowed a thin strip of blood to drip down the outside of the door and around the wheel arch to then drip down into the muddy wheel track. Plus, in the process of the shooting, blood splatters and tissue were blown onto Mr X's upper body. There simply was not enough blood flowing for Tate's final head wound to account for all of the blood found outside of the Range Rover. Most of Tate's blood had dripped to congeal on the rear seat and down onto the floor well. Mr X ejected the used shell which came to rest on the muddy track behind the Range Rover, later being run over and flattened possibly by the vehicle that Mr Peter Fearbold arrived in before coming to a halt behind the Range Rover. Mr X then moved forward just slightly from his position at the rear near the side door of the Range Rover and began to examine the slumped body of Tony Tucker. He had achieved his intention of immobilising the trio with his first barrage of fire he now simply had to apply phase two of his intentions. And that was to make sure, beyond all possible doubt, that the trio were dead. Tucker was now in a sitting position with his left hand side propped against a stationary vehicle passenger seat with his legs slightly sprawled and his head in a forward leaning position from his torso. It was then that Mr X had conveniently positioned himself above Tucker when he then positioned the shotgun 
and Mr. X standing on his tiptoes to give him a little bit more room for the shotgun barrel to be just above Tucker's head. He had to reverse the normal position of his firing hand so he could use his thumb to depress the trigger and allow for the shotgun's recall. So to fire a final blast into the back of Tucker's conveniently drooping head. He was leaving a distinct entry hole that had evidence of flash burns from the closely held shotgun which appeared to be in a slightly upward facing position upon inspection during the autopsy. It had also caused blood and matter splashes to be on Mr X's head and face. He then ejected the used shell which came to rest near the rear of the Range Rover. Suppose one looks closely at the mortuary images. The one that is highlighting Tony Tucker's head when he is lying face down on the table. It is obvious that the hole in the top rear of Tucker's head had to have been inflicted while Tucker was facing to his left. As the shooter would have been behind the front passenger seat headrest in order to have shot Tucker if he had been facing forward as in the stage position that it was found in and having it presumed that the door had been shut. The shooter would have had to have been an incredible unusual contortionist to have been able to shot Tucker in the back of the head if he was sitting facing forward and the door had been obstructing the ability of his body to have ended up naturally in such a position. Mr X then made his way around to the driver's side of the vehicle and was intending to send another shotgun blast into Craig Rolfe but he found that opening the driver's door to further examine Rolfe and being convinced that Rolf was already dead, he wanted to shoot him again just to make sure. Mr X stood looking at Rolf for a moment or so. At this point, Rolf's head injury did not appear to be that graphic apart from Rolf's left eye stuck in an odd position, staring coldly at his right temple. Mr X leaned into the Range Rover slightly and placed the shotgun angled slightly downwards and very close to Rolf's face at the lolling of Rolf's side of his head behind the ear. The bulk of the shot went downwards and fractured Rolf's neck in the process and contained the dispersed pellets in the body. But in doing so, some of Rolf's blood had splashed on the driver's side door and over Mr X's upper body and then deflected off him to leave such small blood stains etched in the snow and ice beside the offside of the Range Rover. Mr X did not eject the used shell, he left it in the gun. After being totally convinced that all three were dead, it was at this point that Mr X was said to have called for Mick Steele to come and join him in a position that he was occupying close to the locked gate while the attack took place. In order for Steele to assist Mr X in manoeuvring Tucker's heavy dead body back into a front facing position for no other reason than to keep it from view from the air by any police helicopter search that may be in progress after a report on the missing men had been lodged with the authorities and could be implemented no other reason. Although Mick Steele was aware of what was planned, he was still shocked and agog at the coldness, focus and determination of Mr X. He merely responded to Mr X's call and went slightly shaken in the process to assist him. Nichols looked on dumbfoundedly shocked at the reality of what had just taken place. Mr X and Steele began struggling and hauling Tucker's body strenuously and slowly leaving bruises to his upper arms just above the elbow that would show up clearly as bruising upon mortuary inspection. They placed Tucker's body back into the passenger seat leaving him with his head facing to the right slightly. This is how it had come to rest after being bundled back into the passenger seat where it continued to seep blood down onto the seat to pool and congeal soaking into the material of Tucker's jeans, mainly onto his right hand side. Not through any specific intent, they even went as far as placing his feet in a casual but comfortable looking position, with Mr X making various sarcastic comments as he placed Tucker's feet in a position as though he had been sitting there having a peaceful doze. He had done something similar to Tucker's hands, leaving them in a position that appeared to be also one of relaxed satisfaction. Then, after placing Tucker's telephone in his lap, which had fallen to the footwall area of the Range Rover when Tucker had first jumped in alarm and had tried in vain to escape from the Range Rover. Maybe in a sort of black comedic sarcastic way, such as try using that now fatso, before closing the Range Rover's passenger side door. When Mr X had concluded with the killings 
and humping Tucker's body back into position and switching off the headlights and shutting off the vehicle's ignition, then closing both offside doors, Mr. X then walked to the rear of the Range Rover and opened the hinge back door lid to retrieve a bag that had been placed there by the trio, maybe filled with cash to buy a consignment of drugs, or maybe a whole stash of drugs they were expecting to sell to someone. The targeted trio were not aimed at the time, so it is not thought that they were going to try to rip somebody off, nor did they feel in such enough danger as to carry firearms for protection, but rather they were trusting in the perceived safety of the meeting in such a secluded location. After retrieving the bag from the rear of the Range Rover, Mick Steele made mention of the used shotgun shells that lay around the Range Rover, only to be told by Mr X that it did not matter, as there would never be trace of the gun that Mr X had used for the murders, as the gun was destined for total destruction, as all the clothes that Mr X had worn. Plus, Mr X said he had made sure prior to his arrival at the Ambrose scene to have completely cleaned all of the shells that he brought with him, so there would be no fingerprints or DNA left on them. The whole of the pump action shotgun had been pre-cleaned so as to leave no trace of anything by using white spirits first, then after the treatment had been taken care of, was then wiped down with ammonia. When Mr X had originally taken it out of the canvas bag on arrival at the crime scene, Nichols had made a comment such as, Phew, what's that prong? It smells like cat's piss. When Mr X then explained what the cause of the odour was, ammonia. Plus, Mr X's choice of gloves that he wore for the duration of the ambush and the killings once he had approached Nichols in the VW back at the pub until Mr X re-entered his own vehicle. The gloves were made from thin chamois leather type material and although they may not be suited to cold winter weather they were ideal for allowing the full use and sensitivity of the fingers for delicate or sensitive work. Unlike a thicker glove such as a pair of riggers gloves or a regular pair of men's gloves whose index fingers may be caught up in the trigger guard of the shotgun and impend the use of the firearm. Nichols had taken notice of the distinct looking gloves after seeing Mr X wearing them in the briefly illuminated interior of the VW Passat as they sat and prepared for the ambush. It is amazing that Nichols never incorporated them into his telling of Jack Worms being the shooter, a false an imaginary involvement on behalf of Jack Worms as told by Nichols. Mr X made his way around to the back of the Range Rover and opened the rear door and retrieved the contents from a bag in the rear, the prize that he knew that would be in there. He stuffed the contents into his blood spattered bulky jacket and reclosed the door. His final act was to reach into the Range Rover and switch off the vehicle's interior and headlights that had been left on while the car had come to its initial stop and was illuminating the locked gated area before closing both the driver's side door and then the driver's rear door that had been specifically left open. Then, Mr X, Steele and Nichols were supposed to have walked a short distance back to the bushy laneway before climbing back into the VW and making their escape. But, as a precaution, Mr X had instructed Nichols and Steele to wait for a few moments while he and Mick Steele after being prompted by Mr X, removed their blood-soaked overalls and the jackets that both had worn and stuffed them into a sack that Mr X had had in the canvas bag that had brought the shotgun in, and then wiped any obvious blood from their hands, heads and faces with a cloth. Mr X would have to wait until returning home or a safe house to totally scrub and shower to remove any gunpowder residue that may have been on him. Then he would immediately set about the destruction of the shotgun and the bag of bloodstained clothes. The shotgun was dismembered or out of the Passat and placed into a bag and zipped up. This was in order not to leave any forensic evidence in the car, blood or gunpowder residue. Nowadays, criminals just burn the vehicles that they use in crimes. As Mick Steel had bought the Passat off Nichols, it was up to him to either totally clean or dispose of it. As it happened, the Passat was found and located after Steele had been arrested for the crime. But thorough forensic testing of the Passat was made by the police and they could find no real forensic evidence in or on it. They did, however, find traces of gunpowder residue, but it was ruled out as being the same as that found at the murder site or in the Range Rover. 
On a returning journey to the Wheat Sheaf pub, so as Mr X could return to his own vehicle and to leave the area, he made it very clear to Mick Steele and Darren Nichols of some of the choices that had been open to him regarding the killings, especially concerning the option that he did not have concerning the fears of being exposed as a shooter by any of the witnesses or associates in the murder. By then revealing to them that he could have easily have blasted both Steele and Nichols to death back at the murder scene and left them there with their ex-friends. But he decided against it. Therefore, they were to both keep in mind and to remember that should either of them ever reveal the true identity of Mr X, that they certainly meet the same fate as their friends no matter where they were or how safe or protected they may have felt. This was to instill an absolute resolve within both Steele and Nichols never in any circumstances to reveal the true identity of Mr X or his involvement in the murders. He also reminded both Mick Steele and Darren Nichols that he had done them an enormous favour killing the trio and it would have cost them a small fortune to have a professional killer take care of the matter for them. This sudden chilling decoration terrified both Steele and Nichols. Nichols could at least enjoy what had gone down with his assistance in the murders as he felt as if he was finally free of Tate's threats and aggression. It had also given him the opportunity to witness the blood on Mick Steele's gloves hands and clothes before he removed them before getting into the Passat which he declared to the police was while they sat in the Passat which Nichols mentioned later in detail to the police. But as far as Jack Wombs was concerned Nichols had never made any mention of Jack Wombs having any bloodstains on his hands or gloves or on person when he was supposed to have been in the VW with Steele and Wombs. Why would he if Jack Wombs was not even present at the murder scene? An explanation that may give some credence to the previously unanswered questions as to the fact that Tony Tucker had mud or sludge on the soles of his boots and how come the back of his thighs and the side of his left lower leg was soaking wet upon inspection at the mortuary when being photographed if he had not left the car. Urine could have been part of the cause of the wet patches on Tucker's pants if he'd have emptied his bladder, but the fresh mess on the soles of his boots so far has remained a mystery. Some believe that Tucker had vacated the vehicle at one stage to relieve himself and this was offered an explanation for the dirt on his boot soles. At the same time, Tate and Rolf had none on theirs, but oddly enough, Rolf had a full bladder as it was discovered at the autopsy and it appeared that he might have been close to bursting for a piss. It was also discovered that Rolf, although suspected of being killed instantly by the first blast to his head, and also like Tucker, he had inhaled blood into his lungs at some stage after being shot. Another small discovery that was made at the mortuary concerning Tony Tucker was an old scar on his head which indicated that it could have been made by a small axe wound. This might give some credence to the belief that Tucker had partaken in organised sucker violence alongside his great pal Carlton Leach, but that is as close as Carlton Leach got to be a major player of the Essex boys. His story and background in soccer violence is his well-known and documented story. And then for nothing to do with the Essex boys apart from his close friendship with Tony Tucker and some paid doorman's work that he'd done for Tucker. Along with the occasional commissioned bashings for Tucker upon other people. Although it may have been the case of Colton Leach along with some other known associates of Tucker to have been forewarned as to giving Tony Tucker a wild birth for unspecific reasons. Now keeping in mind that irrespectively of who may have been responsible for the shootings, neither Steele nor Wombs would ever give evidence against the other. It is simply not within either of their natures. Even as late as today, Jack Wombs would declare that he is innocent. And if asked if he thought Mick Steele could have been involved in the murders, he would state that he had never even asked Mick if he was involved or not. It has always been a moot point for Jack Wombs. But remember that Mick Steele and Jack Wombs have not spent the last 20 years living in cells that are next to each other. Then there is the matter of spending time in different prisons where they could not talk to each other, let alone plan and connive to keep up with the continuation of a tiresome to some joint denial and hope for near miraculous successful appeal or maybe even a retrial. If one listens closely, Jack Wombs never proclaims that he and Mick Steele were guilty of the murders. He specifically states 
he is not guilty of the murders. He leaves it up to Mick Steele to keep denying that he was guilty of the murders. One has to consider that Jack Wimes has never diverted from his denial of being one of the killers. So much so that even when his dying father, Jack Senior, asked him to confide in him if Jack was guilty of shooting Tucker, Tate and Rolf, merely for his old man's peace of mind before dying, Jack Jr. had sworn to his father that he did not take part in the shootings and he was indeed innocent. And then Jack Jr. explaining to his father that he could not see the point in admitting to a crime that he had not committed. Not even if it meant an early release on parole from his sentence, with it being a firm statement that can be still heard from Jack Worms today. Mick Steele does the same. He says that he is not guilty and leaves it up to Jack to continually deny any involvement, which happens to be a sort of major stipulation of the parole board to expect to hear that a prisoner found guilty of an indictable offence should show remorse. Then they consider granting parole to those who do show remorse for their crimes and show signs that they're not likely to re-offend. If Jack and Mick refuse to take any responsibility, then the chances of being granted parole are very slim. Both Jack Worms and Mick Steele know of this ruling, therefore, if they persist and there is nothing they say, then they won't. Then they are really keeping themselves in prison for longer than need be. Jack Worms is now in his early 50s and could be released with some time to enjoy life the best way he can. Whereas Mick Steele is over 70 years of age now and depending on his health, he may never see the outside again. Mick Steele, if it came to him having to give evidence against Mr X by breaking the criminal code of not informing on others, even your enemies, it would be unusual. Plus, Mick Steele was well aware of who he was in bed with, Mr X and his heavy contacts and their multi-tentacled influences. It may have occurred to Mick Steele that it may be better for him to cop a triple life sentence if need be, rather than take a chance and become a victim of Mr X and would be killed even if he was banged up in a prison cell if he ever disclosed Mr X's true identity. After the successful but brutal ambush and killings of Tucker, Tate and Rolf, Mr X, Darren Nichols and Mick Steele made their getaway via the tracks and rat runs of the rural area back to the pub, where Mr X then left Steele and Nichols' company and immediately climbed back into his vehicle, carrying the shotgun in the canvas bag. The sack of clothing that Mr X and Mick Steele were supposed to have worn, plus the valuable contents that was retrieved from the Range Rover. Then, for Mr X to leave and never make contact with Steele or Nichols again.